I'm here with Steve Lightning Krulovitz, the tennis coach at Gilman School, a storied tennis player in the Baltimore area, and a good friend. Actually, Steve, you're the first person I think I met when I came to Gilman. You were walking around the tennis courts. I was looking for, I was looking for a game. You had your backwards hat on, shirt off. I was like, who is this guy? What is Gilman all about? And uh, it was the best introduction that I could have could have gotten and I got involved with some of your tennis camps we got to know each other and I'm very excited to talk to you today about your life your story tennis what tennis means to you coaching lightning strikes a little bit and uh, some of the memories that come up for you when you think about your career in tennis and, and coaching here at Gilman so thank you very much for joining me oh yeah we've been trying to do this for two years so uh, couldn't sleep last night you know <laughs> getting, ready for the, getting ready for the interview. I mean, two years we've been trying to hook up and uh, get this going. So, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Of course. I think where I want to start maybe is just when tennis was first introduced to you. So I was uh, hitting some tennis balls with you, I think, in the fall, and you had – uh, your granddaughter there and you were giving her t the tennis racket and saying she's going to be a stud one day and I think about my life and uh, my dad giving me the lacrosse stick when I was a little kid and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the first time someone put a tennis racket in your hand and when the connection um, you know how the connection started for you to the game. Yeah, you're actually talking about my granddaughter, who's now eight months, so it's been a while. She's Madison Brooke Slover, Maddie B, we call her. And she's definitely going to be a tennis player, definitely playing for UCLA, <laughs> because her parents, my, my daughter and my son-in-law, they're both, you know, love tennis. And I have them come out. They love to play tennis. And she's definitely coming out. And that's, uh, that's one of the things I'll get to how I started with tennis, but that's one of the things that's um, been a little bit down is the participation in tennis recently over the last, you know, 10, 15 years that a lot of, uh, you know, kids aren't playing as much because the parents aren't pushing them into tennis. And the reason why they're not pushing them into tennis is not playing as much themselves. You know, the baby boomers are getting older. And um, so they're not playing as much tennis. Life is hectic now. And um, there's not a lot of time. See, what happened with a lot of kids is, that the parents would go out and play, they bring the kids along. And then like the last five minutes, they, they you know, the, the son or daughter would want to go out and hit some tennis balls. You mm -hmm. know, they might be four or five years old. And that's how a lot of pro players got into tennis. But nowadays it's the, the family dynamics, the sports that they're, they're not there. It's, it's all into feel good stuff, you know, <laughs> team stuff. Yep. And tennis, you know, tennis is, uh, tennis is hard, but, um, I actually, as I told you at the Maryland State Athletic Hall of Fame, at the dinner there when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, um, I wasn't supposed to be a tennis player, as I told the story. I was supposed to be a golfer because my parents were totally obsessed with golf. It's all they talked about. That's all they did on their spare time. Golf. Got taken lessons for at the at Chestnut Ridge Country Club, which no longer exists, exists now. My father used to take an hour lesson and I'd go out with him. And then the last like 15 minutes, you know, he say to the pro, you know, you got 15 minutes left and I want you to teach my son. And the pro would look at him like, what are you, he's four years old, you know? <laughs> and my father said, well, just teach him because he's got good balance. I told the story at the uh, hall of fame, but uh, you know, gravi gravitated over to tennis when I was about seven, liked the movement, always running around, you know, as a kid and a lot of energy. Tennis was more, you know, more movement. Uh, I found it difficult at first. I have to be honest with you, Big Cat. Uh, in the beginning, I had trouble with it. It wasn't natural. So I played a lot of baseball. Uh, um, you know, we played a lot of basketball neighborhood. We played actually, you know, tackle football, even, you know, when I was young, it was touch football and stuff. So I found, I found it a little bit difficult, but uh, stuck with it. And uh, just repetition, had a very good instructor down at Drude Hill Park, Mari Schwartzman, and um, almost quit a couple of times for baseball, but you know, hung in there. I don't know why. I think uh, my childhood friend, Harold Solomon, who was number you know, five in the world, 
Uh, he grew up in Silver Spring, but his parents moved to uh, Miami. I think they had a big influence on keeping me going with tennis because I played doubles with Harold and practiced with Harold and his father took us to tournaments. And it's a story, you know, that's uh, in my book, uh, Lightning Strikes. Uh, it's, it's around here somewhere. I'll just show you, you know, Lightning Strikes, little plug for the book. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about the book yeah. for sure. Yeah, talk about the book. And uh, it's, it's all in the book. And then, um, you know, things went, you know, started getting the hang of things. Things went well, started with, I won seven tournaments in a row when I was 11 on the East Coast, like the Eastern Championships. The Pennsylvania Open, you know, junior championships went up there. I won seven in a row and I beat Harold actually seven times in the final. His father got so crazy uh, uh, that they moved the, he moved the whole family to Florida so he could practice, you know, in the winter. And of course that, you know, that's the, that, that was important because uh, you could play every day down there here, you know, too cold. Now, so too cold now, to play outside. Now, when you start, first started playing tennis, were you – were you absolutely obsessed? Did you have the bug right from the get go? You said you tried to quit a couple of times. You had a you had some interest in yeah. baseball and some other sports. Yeah, ten yeah, ten yeah, tennis is hard. Tennis is lonely out there, uh, and you know, you, you go with team sports. You have all your friends. You go to it's like my sister would drive a car, wait for me to finish because uh, my dad was working. He was a doctor here in Baltimore. My mom, well, we have four kids. My mom was taking care of the other kids. My sister got her license and she could drive. So she took me to some tournaments. You know, she's like four or five years older than I am. So I'm a little kid, basically. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough mentally, the losses. So uh, my first tournament I ever played, Big Cat, I lost uh, 6-0, 6-1 hmm. and, uh, to Richard Healy. He was a moon baller, like professional moon <laughs> And, there nine. and uh, I was, it was over in Congressional Country Club in the DC. And I came back and I told, uh, you know, Mari, uh, I don't know if tennis is for me. I would be honest with you. I told him, you know, I don't, I, you know, I think I'm going to concentrate on baseball. He said, well, I, I'll make a deal with you. Play one more tournament. And if you, if it's not happy, you know, if it's, do you feel the same way? It's all right with me. Fine. So uh, he says, there's coming another tournament coming up, coming up in a couple of weeks, three weeks, down in Clifton Park. So I entered it. I practiced a little harder before the tournament. And the first round, I drew, I, uh, I drew oh, Harold Solomon. I'm nine. He's eight. He's seven. He's seven years old. Just He's going to turn eight in a couple of uh, months. I'm nine. Just kind of turned nine uh, a couple months before, a month or two before. And um, he beats me in three sets. Close, tough match. His father had never missed a match before and he wasn't there for the match because he figured he was just never heard of me. It's going to be 0-0. Harold was the number one player in the middle Atlantic area. at seven. Number one at mm. seven. I mean, you know, he was unbelievable. So uh, he starts crying in the third set. He starts crying on the changeovers. And I, I couldn't, you know, like, Harold, what's wrong? Are you okay? <laughs> He said, my father's not here. My father's not here. His father had gone to a meeting, was going to come back and pick him up after he beat me 0-0. And now we're, you know, in the third set, and he couldn't handle it because his father never missed a match. He was feeling secure. Anyway, uh, I came back, and I told Mari. Mari said, well, this is phenomenal because I looked at the draw, and you're the only person to take a set. Harold won the tournament, went on to win the tournament. Oh. You're the only person in the, in the whole tournament that took a set off number one Atlantic I remember Druid Hill Park on court stand there by the reservoir I was nine years old and I said to him well how do I become number one because I want to become number one and he says you got to practice practice and practice and I said you know what I'm going to do that so I had a goal and that goal at nine years old set me on the path into tennis but it also set me on a path to life because I had goals and I started to realize that you have like intermediate, you know, beginner goals, like, you know, what immediate goals, then you have to have like sort of intermediate goals and you have long range goals. Hmm. Long range goals would be like, you know, you're 14, 
and you see UCLA versus USC on, you know, playing football at in Pasadena at the Rose Bowl, you know, 100,000 people, the palm trees, it's raining here, it's November, it's beautiful out there. Your goal, your four, I'm going to get out to play in California. Look, it's great. I'm going to play tennis for USC or UCLA. And uh, so that's a long range goal. Like the short range immediate goal would be, uh, well, I'm going to play a tournament uh, next week. That's and I'm going to win it. So goals are goals became a big factor in my life very early. And uh, they still are. They still are still have goals. You got to have, you know, you got to wake up and uh, have a purpose. And you got to have those goals. So did you know, um did your coach uh, Mari his his name right Mari your coach Mari Schwartzman yeah how did he uh, I guess influence you or teach you as a youngster playing tennis about those life skills and uh, I mean it sounds like already he encouraged you to keep playing even after you lost a couple of times those big tournaments how did he I guess play a hand in your desire to become great and to practice a lot and to I think, you know, set goals for yourself for the future. Well, yeah, Mari was, uh, he was, he was very good at that because he always give us incentives. Like he'd say, you know, Steve, if you can hit 10 balls in a row, uh, I'll I'll buy you a Coke. You know, if you can hit 10 balls into this corner in a row, when I move you around, you know, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you some chewing gum. Hmm. Cut out a little bit. It was always motivating our lessons to uh, become a better player. And so I learned at a very young age, I started working with him when he was nine. I actually started playing tennis. I started playing tennis at seven, but Maury didn't take me right away. I played with another fellow, his assistant, because he didn't have time. But the reason why he took me, not to get off your question, the reason why he took me is because I, I had a backboard at Jude Hill Park back in the day on the courts, the hard courts, the lower hard courts near mm-hmm. the swimming pool and the reservoir. So the courts were in the middle between those two, the reservoir, the swimming courts, the tennis courts, a whole line of courts, but they had a backboard. So I saw that backboard and I said to my mom, you know, drop me off. Let's go down a half an hour early. I'll hit on the backboard before my lesson. So I'd go down, I'd hit on the backboard for a half an hour. Sometimes I hit the ball over and have to go all the way around and get it. And then afterwards, after my lesson, I had a half an hour lesson, I'd hit it again on the backboard. So Mari was going like, there's nobody, I've been teaching down here for like 15, 20 years. There's nobody ever hit on the backboard before. Mm. You know, you're like the first person. I was, you know, seven years old, you know? So he made time for me and I started working with him. So that taught me that you have to motivate uh, people if you're gonna be a leader. You have to connect, you have to put, you know, the, not, you know, something out there, the carrot, you know, the go for. Right. And and, uh, and, and you do that now with, uh, at least with the little guys I've seen with the point system and they all crowd around the little table and they're asking you, how many points do I have today? And where am I on the leaderboard? And they get so excited about that. Um, so you've definitely used, I guess, Maury's lessons in your own coaching yeah. career too. Definitely, Big Cat. Think of, just think of this. I'm not a gambler, but just think of this. You go to Vegas, okay, and they give you paper chips or paper money to play with. There's, you know, I mean, there's no, there's no thrill, right? Yep. So, you know, you have to, yeah, you, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, it's got to be real. It's got to count. Yeah, so we keep a point standing for the kids, you know, every week. And they fight for those points that mean something. It's just I'm playing the clinic and, you know, there's something at the end of the tunnel. They have points and then we give out prizes. Everybody gets everybody gets a gift. But then the top finishers who uh, come out every week because you can't get points if you don't show up, if you miss. Then the kids are trying to make the makeups if they miss. But it's hard sometimes to do that. And so the kids, you know, persevere. It's all about perseverance. Mm-hmm. They can't. They persevere. They come out every week. They fight for the, they, they they fight hard for the hour and a half, the two hours, whatever they play. And then you know we keep the point standings. And the kids are the kids are competitive. The kids uh, are motivated. They they want to see what their points are. They ask what their points are. Boys and girls, you know, they want to do well. 
Uh, and um, do you, that's a great incentive. That's a great incentive. And and do you do something similar with the high school players, the varsity tennis players at Gilman? I think we're cutting out a little bit. Well, the truth of the matter is, I'm at Gilman. The truth of the matter, Gilman. Uh, John Schmick asked me back in the day. Oh, it's been 10, 12 years. If I would help out with the team, they hadn't won in a couple of years, and, and it was you know McDonough had won like two or three years in a row, and. I had been doing my scams at Gilman for many, many years. It's another story with, um, but that's a great story actually uh, about Gilman. But um, I said, you know what, John, you guys really here at Gilman have been fantastic to me. And, um, I'm going to work with. He said, okay, what, you know, whatever you want to do. I came out and I worked with the boys. Um, music was running the team. And he had, you know, nothing, he, Coach Busick was the best, but he had short practices. And I felt that the guys, some of the guys, especially the singles guys, because he wanted me to kind of work with the singles guys, needed more. So I could stay, you know, another hour and I work with those guys. And we work hard and they won the championship. So I said, you know, hey, this is cool. You know, we won the, this is cool. So they hired me to, uh, they, uh, uh, athletic director, Mr. Holly, Tim Holly. He said, "Why don't we want to pay you if you if you come back be an assistant to Jim? He's going to retire soon, and you know, see if you like it. And if you if things work out, maybe you take over the team because Jim has been here, you know, 28, 29 years. So, long story short, we didn't win for the next three years. Didn't win as assistant coach. Jim retired. I didn't win as head coach. Hmm. So, it's not like it's a guarantee. And then, um, you know, then the goal was just win one championship. Oh my God, you know we." drought three years we hadn't won so it was a lot of you know so it was a lot of uh, pressure but we won and then i was looking on the banners down in the uh, in the uh, basketball arena the athletic center and i noticed that there's only since the uh, mia was formed there's only one team that's ever won two in a row for gilman it's always gilman mcdonough gilman mcdonough they all alternate and I said, there's all the boys. Look, there's only one team that's ever won two championships in a row. Let's try to do that. And, you know, we'll make history. We'll be the second, you know, we'll, we'll be tied with the team that won two in a row. That's, that's something. And, uh, they, 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 and then of course, you know, we looked and we found out McDonough won three in a row. We said, we can't have that. We got to win three. And now we got seven. So yeah, you go down to the to... you go down to the <laughs> tennis courts and you look at the banners down there and the whole I mean the whole wall is almost full the whole fence is full of banners now. Uh, what is the what was the secret for you? What did you figure out there in the first couple of years and and that allowed you to keep winning? And what has allowed you to win the MIAA well, the past what, couple of years the now? I, the secret I found out is that it's a good thing to be a coach at Gilman for tennis. <laughs> That's what I, that's what I found out that because, um, we have 27 championships, which is the most in the history of the school. So that means that we had a lot of committed and, you know, tennis players that took it very seriously. And so that's, that's basically what I found out, you know, that the boys that come out for tennis, um, they don't have, I don't have to tell them. They're, they're thinking championship. Mm. It's just through the years. I mean, it started in 1958. We were MSA. We won four titles in the 60s in a row. But um, and that was something we were shooting for, you know, at the time. And then um, the last, uh, since 2010, we've won seven out of the last 10. So now... And, you know, now the boys know that there's only, we have this streak going and it's fun. Yeah. You know? It's fun. Motivates us, motivates me. It's... And um, we have this streak going where there's only two teams in the history of Gilman school, the football team and the outdoor track team that has won eight in a row. So we were third in as far as in a row. And of course, really down the road, there is the, squash team that won 10 in a row which is you know phenomenal with Smith but um yeah 
that's that's sort of the motivation. And then you know we're going up going after the twenty eighth title. So there's still, you know, there's still some stuff to accomplish. What uh, what's the major challenge, I guess, for you this year coming in and the guys are coming out and you're trying to get another title? What uh, what are you looking forward to and what is going to be the biggest challenge? Do you think this year? Well, it's always pretty much the same. You know, we have to stay healthy, and now we have to be careful because of COVID. Yeah. You know, we can't lose any players. And, uh, you know, the biggest, the biggest challenge, uh, believe it or not, is um, motivating the seniors. Because sometimes, and it hasn't happened all the time, sometimes, and I have to you know, be honest with you, sometimes the seniors kind of check out. Yeah. You know, uh, it happened before. I'm not going to mention any years or anything like that or any players, but, you know, they won a couple of titles or they won the title. And then the next year they weren't as hungry. It's all, it's all about the desire, the hunger, you know, so I don't hit a ball. So, so, you know, I, but so it has to be, the boys have to decide, right. They, that's what we talked in the preseason meeting. You've got to go home tonight and you've got to look yourself in the mirror and have a serious conversation with yourself. No, not joking around, no smiling, you know, like go talk to the preseason meeting, or whatever. And you have to decide, am I all in a hundred percent or I'm, or am I wavering? And here's the thing. If you're not really in a hundred percent, if you don't want to really do it right, then you're better off straight. I'm talking again not coming out for tennis and i'll tell you why because tennis is hard and you're not you know and it's lonely out there and you're gonna have some you're gonna have some struggles and you know if uh, if it's not for you there's no disgrace in that yeah yeah you're not only play, you're not only playing for your yourself and you know but you're playing for you know the team and the school so there's a little bit of that pressure in high school tennis. And uh, you also, you know, you need to enjoy what you're doing. So if you're not really going to be into it, then there's no disgrace. We've had, we've had boys in the past, I've been doing this for almost 12 or 13 years, whatever. There have been boys in the past that said, you know what, this is not for me. Yeah. And that's fine. 100% fine. Right. Right. And, uh, yeah, I think it's the same thing in all sports, but there's something about tennis. Like you said, it's a, it's, it's such a challenging mental game that if you're not all in, if you're not locked in, then you're toast and the team's toast. And, uh, you know, you have to really make that promise to yourself. I think on, on, on in team sports, in some ways you can, yeah, you can be all in, but you can also kind of hide on the team, right? Maybe you're not going to be the one playing out there. Maybe you're on the sideline. Maybe you're not given everything that you can, which is is cancerous to any team. But I think you can hide a little bit more than than in tennis, where you're out there, you're center stage, and it'll be very easy to tell. I think from the first point whether you're all in or not. Yeah, definitely. There's no doubt about that. I mean, um, yeah. It's uh, the, if you're having an off day in a team sport, I played a lot of team sports. Uh, your uh, teammates can pick you up. You can, you know, you're having a bad day, you're off day, you're not shooting the ball well, but, but somebody else might be. So you might want to feed that person. You know, you're, you're, you're not hot. You're having a cold day. And so, you know, you can still win with that. But in tennis, my goodness, you know, the mark of a good player is a player that can a really good player, good high school player, college player, pro player is if you're not playing your best, but you still find a way to win. Mm. And that's a really mark of a good player. And tennis is just like anything in life. You know, it's a uh, confidence. You have to have confidence that you can, you know, get the job done. And uh, they're going to be, you know, I tell the boys, it's like riding a wave. It's going to be up and down. It's not going to be up. You're not going to, you know, be up here all the time. Unless, you know, like 
you have an unbelievable season. Right. But most of the time, it's going to be up and down. So you got to, you know, can't get too high with the wins. Can't get too low with the losses. Got to stay even and keep working towards your goals. And, uh, it, you know, because tennis, like I said, you know, tennis is hard. Um, tell me a little bit about, as a player, how you stayed motivated during those ups and downs, at, you know, as you were kind of going out through your career, what did you really rely on or turn to when you faced those incredible challenges? Well, you know, if you have a bad week, if you, I guess you're talking about professionally. Yeah. Because I played played 11 years. You know, I played, you know, nine Wimbledons and 12 or 13 U.S. Opens. I played eight French Opens. I was in Australia. Um, there's always next week. If you're having a bad week, there's always next week. Try to, you know, figure out, you know, what in your game that you need to see a lot of players are weaknesses. Let's say, you know, they can't come over the back end. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yep. <laughs> and yeah, nothing personal, of course, right? <laughs> no, no, but, of course uh, not. Instead of working, instead of working, you know, the time on the court trying to hit your topspin backhand, why don't you work on your strengths, which might be, your forehand ring a bell yes yep and uh, so (laughs) you know work more on your get your strengths really strong don't worry so much about your weaknesses and then in the clutch situations in the tight situations go with your strengths and okay it's a little different than most coaches and most players work a lot on their weaknesses oh you know but work on your strengths if you, you know, and you, so you've got to know what your strengths are though. And that's where a coach can come in and say, you know what, you volley really well, really well at the net. You've got great grips. Technique is really good. One of the best I've seen, but you never come to the net. Yeah. So why don't you come in more? So you got to look at each individual and kind of figure it out. And luckily, you know, work with great coaches uh, at Gilman, you know, Josh Evans. And, you know, guys have won, guys played in college and, um, you know, Frank Donnelly, you know, a lot of, a lot of great guys that uh, also help out have another pair of eyes that they can see, which is very important because I used to coach a team by myself, but then I brought in some other guys and it's, boy, it's great, you know, so get a different perspective. They see things that you don't see. So it really helps the coaching. The boys like it, they, yeah. you know, they get, they get sick of me and, um, yeah, but that's so true. That's such an important coaching tip because I think about my my career and I and a lot of the times in lacrosse, I spent so many hours working on my weaknesses, even though I knew there were weaknesses, um, which is important. Yeah, you have to be serviceable with your offhand in lacrosse, and you have to, you know, you have to be able to catch and finish and and work on that. But a lot of the times, coaches say your your offhand and your strong have to be equal, and that's just not true. And I think you're exactly right you should strengthen your strength and become dominant you know, uh, at what you're good at. Yeah. When I got, I'll tell you, uh, this is maybe not quite what we're talking about, but when I got to UCLA, uh, the coach there was coach Bassett. He won seven NCAA titles and he's a, he's a legend at the school. And, um, he told us, I don't want you guys practicing on the weekends. And we were like, you don't, he said, no, I want you guys, you know, don't, you know, do your studies, studies, the most important, you know, catch up on your studies, go to the beach, you know, relax. I, I don't want you coming out here and playing on the weekends. I'm thinking to myself, what coach in the world anywhere yeah. would tell their players not to play. And that was, I found out that some of the guys went and played anyway, but they didn't play at UCLA. Because it just, you know, one of those type of eight personalities. But I found out that, you know, you come out fresher if you have a little break. Mm. Take a day or two off. And then I found out that when I was on the Pro Tour, the pros don't play every day. People think that Roger Federer is out there practicing every day. Well, guess what? He's not. You know, they take a day or two off. And that helps you mentally. Yep. You know, rest your body a bit too. But it helps you mentally. And you come back fresher. So, you know, that's, uh, that's an important lesson. Yeah, very true. And uh, one thing my coaches used to say in college is get your extra work. Like you always had to get your extra work every single day. And you you should do something extra, like 
you know, hit the wall or take some more shots or come out earlier. And that's important too, is to get a little bit of extra work. But some days, and I remember this very clearly, one of my friends after a hard practice and it had been a long week and we were getting ready for a game, he was like, I think my extra work today is to go lie down, <laughs> like go get some rest. Yeah. And that's what you're absolutely. saying. And you know what? That's where you have to reiterate the fact to your players, no matter what sport, that they need to co communicate with you and not be scared to communicate with you. Like if they're not feeling it, I, I want to know if you're feeling tired, if something's bothering you, that you can't focus, you can't concentrate, you're having a bad day. I want to know so I can adjust, you know, the practice for you or talk to you. I want to know what's going on because uh, you can't run somebody into the ground. Yep. Yep. And I, it's very important that the players are honest and they communicate say, look, you know, I've got a lot of work. Can I leave practice a little bit early today? And of course, you know, I'm open. The door is always open. It's like Johnny Wood at UCLA. I was going to ask you about. I was, was going to ask you about yeah, Coach Wood when the door when the when Coach Wooden's door was open in Pauley Pavilion, his office. Anybody in the school, anybody actually, people outside the school didn't know this, but anybody could go in and talk to him. And on my way down to class from the dorm, I passed Pauley Pavilion. But if I go up the steps, a couple three flights, and keep walking straight in the direction I'm going, Johnny Wooden's office is there. The door is closed. Don't knock. He's busy. So a couple of times, more than a few, you know, go through there on my way back from class. I had some time, let's say, and Johnny's door would, John Wooden's door would be open. And uh, so I could go in and I could talk to him. And I could ask him questions about how he runs practice. And, you know, and, what and do you think about so-and-so? And, and he was always very really nice and you Great had guy. and you felt very comfortable going to legendary coach's office as a college student who played a different sport you you kind of just felt like you could yeah, do that anybody anybody could go in you didn't have to play sports any any student could go in i'm sorry if i didn't clarify that any student but i would go in and say you know i would go and introduce myself when i first met him and you know tell him i'm playing on the tennis team and um and then you know he would like so what okay. kind of what kind of questions did you bring to them? What what kind of things did you ask him? Well, I I actually uh, after practice sometimes I'd go down and watch the basketball guys practice, and they had a they had all these kids like college you know kids that went to school that were helping out in practices, and I stood in there I watched in Paul Pavilion there was nobody there just the team, and he'd blow the whistle and the guys would run to the closed. It's over the place, you know, so they could play horizontal, vertical, you know, with, with a lot of classes and things like that. And so they had them all ready. So uh, one of the things that you might like if you're a basketball fan, he, he would blow the whistle and the guys would run to the closest foul line. And one of the kids from the school would have the basketball and give it to him. And then he'd shoot, they'd shoot, you know, three free throws. So I'd ask Johnny about that. He says, look, when you're, t you know, we do that because we're practicing hard and you're tired. And that's when you shoot the free throws when you're tired during the games. Mm -hmm. So we, we're trying to say, you know, you got to get used to that being tired shooting the free throws. Not at the end of practice when everything's cooling down, but during when your heart's really pumping, he said, you know, and then you got to get to the line and shoot the free throws. And that's why, you know, that's why we, we do little things like that. Yeah. So did you, that did, was, that did you go into his office and ask for advice for your, your tennis game? No, because he's a basketball player, but I played some basketball. And uh, it was more, you know, Johnny, John would talk more about, uh, you know, motivational things. That's what I thought, like to, to motivate you or to prepare I, you I, for I tennis, mean, he would help you. I don't know if you'll be busy. I have up on the door of the tennis house up at the courts here at Gilman. I've got uh, two quotes, motivational quotes from a John that he would always tell me. So it's kind of cool that, you know, I can look at that and he, you know, he sort of lives on. Right. So that's awesome. That's a cool story. Yeah. So, come, you know, come up if you have, uh, if you guys are practicing, you finish, I'll show you the motivational, you know, quotes that they're pretty, pretty nice. So when you, when you meet with your players for the preseason meeting for tennis next, next week or the week after when you're yeah. just starting to get yeah, we're, going. We're, we're, yeah. 
Yeah, we're not doing in, we're not doing the indoor meeting because and of COVID. We're just meeting out at the courts, and then we're going you know going over a couple of things. Not long. And I you, don't like long meetings. No long meetings, but just when no you, when you meet with your players at the beginning of the year and you're going through like the keys to success. You mentioned a few of them already, but what are some other I guess keys? for success for you as a coach that you absolutely need? You need the buy-in from the players. They have to all want to be there and be fully prepared for a, yeah. for a season. Well, it, what else? Yeah. The players have to understand uh, one very important thing, that um, that if they go to a if the majority of them, 80% of the players, if they go to another school, Besides Gilman, they're either going to be starting in the MIA lineup in singles or doubles. But at Gilman, you know, they have a hard time even making the team. So, you know, they have to understand that it's, you know, very competitive. And like I said, if, and it's something they have to realize that just because they have to go play JV or fresh soft doesn't mean that they're not good tennis players or they can't start at varsity one day. It just means that from coach's point of view, we've been very fortunate to have quite a lot of good players. You don't win 27 championships without pounds. So that's tell them they have to understand that. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. I think uh, I, I, I'm curious where that like started with Gilman because you said you came in you're, as a as a early coach. You're losing a little bit. You're getting the team back on track, and now it just seems like good tennis players come to Gilman. And is that because of the legacy and and the wins and the championships that we've had recently, or is that because of your camps and recruiting, or or why is mm -hmm. that? Do I, you think, think? I think I think yeah, great que great question. I think that uh, truthfully. I think that the, um, the structure of the school, the academics, uh, the, the creed of the school, I think that plays a tremendous part in the success of, uh, you know, getting good tennis players, getting good kids to come to Gilman. Yeah. It's not, it's not about the tennis, but it's about the school. Gilman is a very fine school. And uh, it's one of the top schools. And there's nothing more important than education. Mm -hmm. So a lot of parents want their kids, want their you know boys, to go to, you know, a school that has uh, great academics, which is the most important thing, and also has you know good sports. So I think through the years, um, a lot of parents have sent their kids to Gilman for that reason. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Um, and, so, you know, some of them, a lot of them play tennis. Yeah. Yeah, and the mental component to now tennis. It's not as many. Now it's not as many. Now it's not as many because tennis is a bit down. I mean, people call things like this. tennis a bit down. It's, you know, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. I mean, tennis was people walk around with tracksuits on. I'm like the only person in Baltimore that walks around with the track suit on <laughs> to go into a get a, or something. Nobody wears track suits anymore. Before, people would not only wear track suits, but you see some guys with headbands like Borg or McEnroe with, in, in track suits. You know, it yeah. just it's just um, not as not as popular, unfortunately. Um, for you growing up in Baltimore, um, and I and I know how. We've talked about it, how intense of a game tennis is, how lonely of a sport, how much time you have to spend practicing on your own, hitting that bounce back, similar in some ways to hitting the wall in lacrosse. Um, but they're totally different sports. They're totally different games. And I would say m mentally, tennis is probably the, the hardest sport there is. I mean, you could maybe make the argument for golf, but just the athleticism and the mental component required for tennis is – it takes a lot of training and a lot of time on your own and preparation for you, your career growing up. How did you uh, kind of maintain that? How did you like force yourself to get out there on your own? Was that, was that, I guess, natural uh, once you started playing the desire to win, well, um, but yeah, to get to the get, place that, right. that you got, how, you know, how'd you do that? 
I mean, I didn't get I didn't get burned out because I played other sports, but I did you know play a lot of tennis in the summer, in the spring. Uh, I played two sports in high school in the spring lacrosse and tennis, but I never got I never got burned out with tennis. But the thing about tennis is, you know, every ball that comes to you, the cat, every single ball that comes to you is a challenge to get it back. So I, I, I was a competitive kid and I found that I, you know, was enjoying that challenge. Challenge of getting, no matter, you know, and so that's what kept me in tennis for so long, I think, as a competitive player, just the everyday challenge practice in matches, making sure, trying hard to get every ball back in play. You see that with, uh, like, Nadal, you know, every ball, he's got to get it back. I got to get that ball back, you know. I mean, that's what he's thinking, I'm sure. Got, I got to make that shot. And uh, that, that keeps, that's why he's 35 and he's still, you know, he's winning big tournaments. I mean, that's what that's what tennis does to you. <laughs> we were we were texting a little bit about Nadal during the uh, Australian Open, and I was watching him, and I really kind of got into the Australian Open because I was at, I was out of school for a little bit, and I was at home grading. I got exposed to COVID, so I was just at home, and I didn't have it, but I was watching the Australian Open that week, and uh, I was noticing a lot of different things about all of the tennis players, Nadal particularly, his routines, every little thing that he does. You know, he's got the he wipes his sweat off his hair and he and he bounces the ball a certain amount of times and his towel is completely straight on the sideline, his water bottles are labels facing out. Um, <laughs> tennis does that. Does tennis do that to you or does tennis attract that type of Yeah, there's a lot of superstitious uh, tennis players. Like Bjorn Borg when he after he won his first Wimbledon and he had to have the same locker the next year. And he, he stayed in a hotel in this hotel in London that we had to have a uh, hotel room and then he wore Fila clothes and the shirt and the shorts that he wore to win his first Wimbledon championships he, he packed them in his bag and took them to London and he didn't wear them until the final so uh, tennis. I used to have a mission uh, that before my match before I went off to play my match I'd take my, one of my rackets because you carry a lot of rackets. I had like 12 rackets. I take one of my rackets to the stringer and have and tell him, you know, can you string this up for tomorrow? It was like a little, like I'm going to win this match mm-hmm. and I need my racket strung for tomorrow. So I'm going to give it to you now kind of thing. So you have a lot of superstition. <laughs> and uh, Swedes are very superstitious. Also. But a lot of the players have superstitions for sure. Nadal has, Nadal has a lot of what you call rituals. Ritual. ritual. He, he doesn't call them superstitions. No, he has rituals. Yeah. You know, with all, all the stuff that he does. But a lot of players, uh, rituals are great. Rituals are very, very good to have. Um, like, you know, I, when I go to return serve and I walk to the other side after the points over, you see some guys are fiddling with their racket strings. You know, they're trying to fix their racket strings, to, you know, because they get a little out of out of sorts. Mm-hmm. And then they get ready for the return of serve. And then after the point's over, they're fixing. They're keeping their focus on the racket, yeah. on the strings, yeah. you know. Because you know what? The worst thing that you can do in tennis, Big Cat, do you know what it is? Think. Once you, once you start thinking, you're in trouble, okay? Because um, then you get indecisive. And then you start thinking negative thoughts, possibly. Mm. So you've got to keep it, you know, got to keep your head positive. You got to keep, you know, and <laughs> you can't think. You've got to make up your mind beforehand. You got to visualize when the guys, you know, where you're going to hit your serve or where you're going to hit your return before he does it. And then you got to go for the shot. And if the ball comes, you got to make up. You see, it, you know, you have a, a second or two. You see the ball coming cross court. You got to make up your mind if you're going down cross court. You can't think got to be you have to react and um that's what changed my whole uh career my entire career it's in lightning strikes a big big chapter i had a slump when i was 15 16 i wasn't i was doing well locally but i wasn't winning anything on the uh, national stage and i went to kalamazoo for the nationals uh 18 and under and harold solomon's father came up harold was playing the 16s because he's younger i was in the 18s my first year 
me today. And I said, well, I played Matt Claflin. He was the number six. Floor. He says he was a final player. This is the national tournament. So I'm playing Claflin first round. He says, here's what I want you to do, Steve. I want you to juice the ball. Juice it. And we're like, what do you mean, Lenny? That fox, we called him the fox. What do you mean? He's very, very smart, you know, tennis, uh, and in tennis and business too. And he said, I just want, to, when you see the ball, I just don't want you to think, I just want you to go for it. Hit it as hard as you can. I don't care where it goes, just juice it. And I went out and I beat Claflin. I got to the quarters of the nationals. And when the ball came, I just didn't think. I just went for the shots, you know? Mm. And uh, that changed my whole career around because then colleges were interested in, you know, but um, I was thinking too much. Oh, am I going to miss this? You know, what's going to happen? If, you know, if I don't win this match, I'm in a slump. Is it going to continue? You know, all these thoughts. How about a time when you were down in a big match and you're losing a couple sets and you start to think, um, I'm sure that's. I mean, I mean, I was watching the Australian Open, and there are a couple, in in the Nadal Championship match. I mean, he's down two sets. He's down, I think, forty love. Uh, I think it was three two or something. Medvedev. Two three. Yeah. Two three. Well, yeah. yeah. There's a couple. There's a couple of things about that. First of all, I'll take it from Medvedev made a, a major, major mistake, and I've been there before myself. He let down. He didn't put the gas on, you know, he didn't, he had, it's like a boxer. You got the guy, he's in trouble and you kind of let up a little bit. And then he comes back in the 12th round, he knocks you out. Mm -hmm. He should have put everything he had into the third set, every ounce of energy in his body, everything. Yeah. No, no, don't think about, you know, he's up two sets of love. He figures I got this guy, you know, don't think about the, the fourth set or the fifth set. That's not happening. Yep. What's happening is everything I've got into this and I'm winning this set and he didn't do that. So that was experience. Hopefully, hopefully he'll learn, you know? And, and the second thing about that is one of the hardest things to do in tennis is close your opponent out because when you're down, you're fighting harder. Right. Okay. When you're up, you, re you relax a little bit. It's human nature. So, you know, instead of you beat the guy seven, six in the second set, with Medvedev, I would say beat the guy worse in the third set. Beat him 6-4, maybe even 7-5, I'll accept. But beat him, you know, 6-3 or 6-2. Crush him. Yeah. Don't let him back into the match. And that's what he Let the guy back into the match. It happens all the time. It's happened to me. I've been on both sides of the coin. But you have to realize, and I realized it once, you know, years in actually bring up that, uh, you know, you've got to set that goal. That, you know, whatever, you beat the guy in the first set, 6-4, you got to beat him worse in the second set. You've got to push yourself. It works. Would you, would you say Didn't that's, would you say that's the, uh, m the hardest part of tennis is keeping an even keel when you're either down or up is just staying centered and then, and not getting too high on yourself and not getting too negative on yourself. It's just staying in the moment. Is that the hardest part of the game? Yeah. I mean, if you can stay cool and not show your opponent that he's getting to you and you know, you just staying cool. Right. Yep. Your opponent starts a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times your opponent starts thinking, Hey, I'm beating this guy. Why is he not getting upset? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What's, what's going on here? And it puts a little negative thought into that guy's head. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe I can't beat this guy. Right. He's not even, you know, he's not reacting to the fact that I'm winning a set and break. Yeah. He's just, you know, so it's, it, it, it's mind games. Yeah. It's mind games. It's all you know, psychological. It's, it's the, it's the best. It's totally mind games. It's totally mind games. If I see that you're getting really upset, that spurs me on. I think to myself, Hey, you know what? But if I'm really cool, even though I'm losing, it's like, why, why is he not getting upset? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, people are just human. Yeah, I mean yeah. the same thing. Uh, response. Same so, thing applies yeah. in uh, in lacrosse as well. I mean, we talked about it all the time. We talked about it. At Gilman is, you know, when it's really cold out and you've got your hands in your pockets, like don't do that, or don't sit down on the field, or, you know, um, all of these little things that 
yeah, it probably doesn't matter that much, but you're showing your opponent, oh, this guy's a little bit cold. Oh, this guy's a little scared. Oh, it's, you know, this guy's tired. Don't sit down on the on the field or don't take a knee on the field, right? Stand up. Don't even put your hands on your knees when you're sprinting. Why? Because you're you're showing some weakness to your opponent. You know what I really like in tennis, Big Cat? I really like when a player shows emotion, like after a great shot. Like, come on! Yep. You know, like Dal does. Medvedev doesn't Michael, do that much. You know, M- M- Michael Chang. I like I like when players show a little bit of you know, they, that pumps you up. You know, get your body you know get your body going, pumps the adrenaline, and come on. You yeah. know, after a good shot or something like that. Yeah. And it also you know it gets you into it. Right. You know, I mean, here's the thing about here's the thing about tennis, and it's probably. It, you can relate this to anything in life, class at Gilman, you know, job, uh, lacrosse, you know, wh- whatever you want, business. Uh, you have to say to yourself that there's no place in the world that I would rather be right now than doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. There's no place in the world that I'd rather be than out here for tennis, for example, fighting my guts out because I love it. This is what I wanted to do. I don't want to be in California, you know. <laughs> I want to be right here, you know, because I had a place in California. I don't want to be in California overlooking the ocean. No, I want to be here. This is what I want to do. This is what, you know, I want to fight it out. Yep. There's no place in the world I'd rather be than what right here, right now, doing what I'm doing. And that you can put that in anything, in anything you do in life, class, you know, um, you, you know, business, you name it, business, right. profession that you're going to go into. There's nothing now. You got to find that thing that you, that really motivates you like that. And that's not so easy to find sometimes. But if you, if you find it, which I've found it. Yeah. Found it. You, 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 you hold on to it because so many times when I was fighting and dying out on the court, I said to myself, you know what? There's no place in the world I'd rather be right now than doing what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. And yeah. maybe I lost. But you know, when I had respect afterwards, not only for my my opponent, but also for myself. I had respect. Yeah. I laid it all out there on the line. You know, what can what else can you do? Yeah, that's awesome advice, and you and and that's why it's awesome to see these guys get excited about their their points because you can tell that they're having some fun out there because it's such a serious and and focused sport. Uh, when they throw the fist bump up, or even even Kyrios, I like watching Kyrios jump around. He's having some fun, and that's and that's the, the, that's what it's all about, right there. I always felt that I played better when I showed a little motion, like "Come on, you know." Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> you, know, you're, you know, you're having fun, and yep. you're, but you're, you're, you're fighting. You're having fun, and uh, you know you can't ask for more than that. I love when my I love when my players uh, Jaime Zaga who coached on the pro tour for four years. Uh, I love when he would pump up vamos. Yeah. You know, I love that. I mean, I love when my players should. You know, it's good to stay cool. You know, can't get carried away, but showing some emotion gets sort of gets you into it somehow. Uh, it's hard to describe. What, hard to what, describe. What would you say separates the 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 top of the top players like Nadal? So Medvedev, I thought he was going to win the thing because he was the Australian Open because he was so focused. He didn't really show it. He was all business. What, uh, he, what, what separates I mean, Nadal? You know, great questions. Uh, he, he, you know, he doesn't have the arrogance, Nadal. Like he, he, what, what killed, he's not overconfident. He's confident in himself that he can do it, but he's not overconfident. I felt that Med won the US Open. He holds up two sets of love. He got a little arrogant. Like, you know, I'm going to take this guy. You can't never think that in mm-hmm. tennis. You know, you can't, you can't have that overconfidence. Yeah. You got to do your talking with your racket. Right. And um, like I said, I, I thought he was a little arrogant yep. in his mind. Like, you know, Hey, I just won the U S open. I'm beating you. And, uh, but it's not over, not over till the fat lady sings. Right. Exactly. In, in, in any, in any sport, doesn't matter what sport. There's yeah. one there's one question that I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about here and there's a lot to talk about. I think we uh you know, we could go for a couple hours, but um I, I want to keep it to about an hour, but I definitely want to get to the 
question everyone's wondering is what where did lightning the name lightning come from everyone calls you lightning you have nicknames for all your players nicknames for me you gave me a nickname on the first day i met you no no you told me your nickname i told you my nickname and you've called me big cat ever yeah, since Yeah, because you know when, you, when, you're, when you're when you're working let's say you know i've been fortunate that you know i've worked with a lot of kids let's say you know come to they've come to camp i mean down at the old courts we had 11 we had 11 courts and sometimes you know we had you know 77 kids a day i mean coming out this is back in the day how, how can anyone remember 77 kids names but if you give them nicknames it's much much easier mm-hmm. so that that's that's how the nickname started okay and a lot of kids think a lot of people think even people i meet sometimes out on the street think i give the nicknames a lot of kids come with nicknames you came with big cat yep you know, I, I came to uh you know with lightning that was my childhood nickname and the, and the way i got that nickname was when i was and it's it's in lightning strikes when i was young i couldn't pronounce my name i couldn't say steven i'd say beaven i couldn't pronounce my name so can imagine you're you know four years old or three years, you know and you can't pronounce your name you go into a shell so my parents got a speech therapist to try to teach me steven you know and i wouldn't i couldn't say river i'd say river so here here i am five years old six years old can't pronounce my name can you imagine and um go to the neighborhood and all the kids would be out there playing and you know ball and stuff and hey you know what's your name moved into a new neighborhood what can you imagine i couldn't say my name because <laughs> they laugh at me so uh, they say okay okay you know you play you play over here down down here and if the ball gets by you you understand what i'm t- talking about and i said yeah you know you chase it down so they're playing and somebody throws the ball and like a pinky ball and it starts heading for the when the alley and it's heading for the street and i chase it down and everybody goes like i come back the ball to sort of lead a bike that was the leader, big Mike Freeman. He's a lawyer in Baltimore now for many years. And uh, he says, you're fast. And then as he said that, it was during the summer, you know, here comes the thunder, here comes the rain, and it starts pouring on us. All the kids scatter from the alley. Big Mike, it's not close. It's, it's, he's, he lives close to the alley right there. His house is right up there. He runs up to his porch and he yells, I'm standing. I don't know what to do. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I'm five years old. And he yells out, hey, lightning, lightning, you know, lightning. Come on, get up here. Come up here out of the rain. So that's how I got my nickname, lightning. (laughs) (laughs) That's the greatest story. I love that story. You know, all the kids come to who's going to play here. And they go, who's lightning? He's lightning. And they say, hey, lightning, you know, I'm a, I'm book man, you know. (laughs) You know, this is, this is, you know, Hannibal, <laughs> you know, you know, the guy Hannibal and uh, everybody had nicknames. So I fit right in to the, you know, and uh, that, that's it. And it stopped right into the, right into the neighborhood. <laughs> that's a great story. Um, so lightning, we're getting to the end here. Uh, you have a couple book recommendations for the listeners, the guests. What, yeah, uh, what do I you do. suggest I've we, a, we check out? I've got a great book here. I bought it up here. It's called Younger Next Year. It's written mm. by a real prominent doctor. It's about exercise. Nice. Great, great book. Easy read. Can change your life. I gave, uh, I sent it to a couple people. They got the book and they come back and they text me, this book changed my entire life. Here's got a couple of rules. I'll just read them real quick. Uh, exercise six days a week for the rest of your life. Do serious aerobic exercise four days a week for the rest of your life. Do serious strength training with weights two days a week for the rest of your life. Spend less than you make. It's not only about exercise. It's about your life, Hmm. but not in an arrogant way. You know, quit eating crap. Care about other people and other things. Get involved. Like for the last uh, 12 years, I joined an organization, a Buddhist organization. Hmm. I'm not really a Buddhist, but I joined an organization that... um, it's called Sokai Kakai International. They have 12 million members. And um, 
it started in Japan. And the goal of this organization is for world peace, education, and cultural exchange. And how it goes about is, and during the chant, you can chant for world peace, okay? You can chant for, for example, when I heard that you were sick a little bit with COVID, and I did my chanting session, which I've been doing more of recently because of the situation in the world, mm-hmm. especially world peace, if you follow what's going on internationally. Uh, I chanted for you, that you would be healed, that you would be better. Okay, in, in that time that I did. Thank you. And you can chant for things for yourself. You can chant for, you're welcome. You can, chance, you can chant for things for yourself, okay, for different things. And um, or you can chant for other people or you can chant for a cause. So it's, so it's, quite, a, it's, it's quite an organization. Wow. And they have, they have you know, I'm one of the 12 million, but they have um, people in this organization, like actors like Orlando Bloom. Patrick Duffy was before your time. I think he was in Dallas. They have uh, Orlando Cepeda. He's in the Hall of Fame in baseball. They have athletes. Roberto Baggio from, from Italy, one of the greatest soccer players in the history of Italy. They have musicians like Herbie Hancock, Tina Turner that have joined this organization. And uh, it's, 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 you know, they, they connect with, um, I have a group in Palm Springs that I connect with and we chant for different things. Mm. Sometimes the leader's father can be sick sometimes somebody has covid you can chant for different things and um there's newsletters that they send out just to finish the book eat quit eating crap so it's 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 quite good care and then connect and commit so some of the things and they go through it in this book great really really excellent really excellent book i think anybody gets this i'll check it out very very straightforward to the point that's what i like um yeah no it's an easy read. It's an easy read. Great, great book. I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more about the uh, the Buddhist organization sometime because I did. I I went to a yeah. Buddhist monastery uh, over winter break just to check it out to see what it was like because I do a lot of meditation stuff and uh, I wanted to see what their whole philosophy was and how they practiced and it was a really cool experience. It was just a weekend. There wasn't much talking. It was a lot of meditation, some chanting, some walking meditations and. Uh, uh, I, I'm interested in this organization you're in. Yeah, um, a lot of you know when you meant when you mentioned Buddhism, everybody oh, 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 everybody thinks it's like a religion. You know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, it's more it's more of a it's to me, and I think what people have to realize is it's more of a practice. Yeah. Yeah. Than, than a religion than a religion. And a lot of it you know, does they, help. They're not saying they're not saying that this is the you know, way to go, so to speak. Right. It's more, it's more about what's, what's around you. Like they do a big thing on, uh, on the environment, a lot of, a lot of, um, articles, meditation, conferences, conventions about the environment. So nuclear disarmament Mm. is is a big thing. I mean, yeah, that, that's what it, that's what uh, this organization is about. But I, yeah, I like to hear more about what, you know what you experienced. Yeah, sounds cool. Yeah, it's um, good. Good right. stuff. We'll, we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, yeah. And then the the main book is Lightning Strikes, and uh, what inspired yeah. you to write we'll Lightning Str- Strikes, and where can people where can people purchase a copy of Light- oh, Lightning you can, Strikes? You can, get, you can get Lightning Strikes on Amazon. Um, I was reading this book on uh, Zoltan. Uh, Zoltan, what's his name, uh, the soccer player, and uh, I was reading his 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 biography. And after I read it, I said, you know, hey, it might be fun to write something like he like he did. And uh, that was, you know, years years ago. It took me four and a half years to write this book, so I apologize for not remembering his last name. But I started, you know, I came out with this book in like 2017, and it took me four and a half years to write that. So it's a long time ago already. I, know. I loved lightning strikes and, uh, and people should definitely read it and check it out and learn more about your, your story and your background and some of those tennis matches and, and you get really into your thoughts in your head. And I always find that so interesting. Yeah. So it's a lot of stuff that we talked about here. If you, in the, in the, you know, in the podcast, yeah. keeping your, keeping it cool. 
yeah. especially when you have in a stadium and you're got a lot of people against you. You can't, you know, you got to keep it together. You got to keep your head together. But the book that I'm haven't started yet, but I, I wanted to uh, suggest I haven't I haven't read it. Just I just got it. It's called a um, a Southerner's Wrecking with the with the myth of the lost cause. It's Robert E. Lee and me. And mm. It's written by a general, retired general in the U.S. Army, who grew up in the South, and he debunks a lot of the myths about the Civil War. It's all about the Civil War. Hmm. And um, I haven't read it yet, but I heard that it's it's very good and very heavy. So definitely check. The, it. What's it called again, sir? Robert E. Lee and me and me, basically about Civil War and how the South, were, you know, was, they were rebels. They wanted to break away from uh, the United States and about slavery. And I haven't I haven't started reading it, but uh, I heard. But this this gentleman who's a southerner, it's a very good book. Excellent. All right, there's three books, and uh, we'll we'll, po we'll post them on the YouTube site so people can in the link below click on it. Go to Amazon. It's pretty easy. It's all right there. Um, yeah, they want to purchase it. Yeah. So Lightning, thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. It was a lot of fun talking to you. It's always yeah. a pleasure. And uh, best of luck this season with tennis. I'm excited to check out some matches and follow you guys yeah yeah i appreciate you having me on as i said and um good luck with lacrosse and you know stay safe stay safe my friend you too thank you very much okay thank you talk to you soon